Welcome. Thank you for watching this teaching video from Oak Tree Community Church in South Bend, Indiana. Please check out our other videos and don't forget to like and subscribe. Our mission is to help people come to know Jesus better and love Him more every day. We believe this will not only help our own spiritual growth, but also help us better influence the community and the world for Christ. For more information about Oak Tree, please visit us at oaktreechurch.com. There you'll find past message series, online giving options, and more information about our discipleship process that we call The Path. Now, enjoy this message. We'd love to hear from you in the comments or the website contact form. Thank you. We started a series last week called Overview, where we are going through the Bible um, quickly, like only in a matter of about six weeks or so. We'll go through. In fact, we're not even just going through the Bible in six weeks. We're going to go through the Bible multiple times in six weeks. I don't know if you know that's even possible, but <laughs> we're taking it with a couple of different looks, a couple of different perspectives at the time. And the reason to do this is it's so easy to get uh, sucked down into a small area and, and, and uh, using the illustration of the forest and the trees, uh, we, we can't see the forest for the trees is how we say it because we get so, so sucked down onto the tree level, the leaf level, microscopic, magnifying glass level that we forget that there's an entire forest there and we need to make sure that we connect the little stuff to the big picture. And so what we're doing is we're doing an overview of the Bible exploring the big picture of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And we're starting, of course, in what we call the Old Testament, what I like to call volume one, uh, because, uh, for, because of the terminology that we'll talk about in a couple of weeks. Uh, the Old Testament is volume one, the New Testament is volume two, and uh, that makes a whole collection of 66 individual writings, so that we have 66 now. We talked in the uh, second hour last week that in the Old Testament, the 39 books that we have in the, the Hebrew Bible, there are only 22 because they cram some of them together. And so it's the same stuff. We just, you know, break it out a little bit. And one of the things that we believe about the Bible that we have to understand is that we believe, and I'm, because I think it's true, that the Bible is completely true in everything that it presents. Okay? Uh, the term we use is inerrancy. It is without error. No error anywhere. Now, the reason I say in everything that it presents is because, well, there are some untruths in the Bible, aren't there? There is some stuff in the Bible that is simply not true. Does that cause anybody a little heart attack? Do you have a problem with that? Okay, I just got done saying it's without error, and yet there are stuff in, there's stuff in the Bible that's not true. Because what the Bible does is it accurately records when people are wrong. It accurately records when somebody tells a lie. Okay, so I don't want to say that the lie is true because the lie is a lie, but the Bible accurately records that's what was said, and it says that's a lie. <laughs> okay, and so the Bible itself is without error. It doesn't lead us into error, even when it contains our human faults. And I think that's one of the geniuses of what God did when he inspired the biblical text is that he, he uh, preserved it from error while still accurately presenting our errors and our sinfulness and our flaws. And I think that's very cool. And We sometimes don't think about it that way. It also tells us, we know from 2 Peter 1, that uh, God has given us everything necessary for life and godliness, right? Through the full knowledge of the one who called us. And we, how do we find out about the one who called us? It's through the Bible, which means that in the scriptures, we have everything we need to live a godly life without error, okay? We don't do that very well, but it tells us everything that we need. What it doesn't tell us is the whole story. The Bible does not tell the whole story. It was never intended to tell the whole story. While it is accurate about everything that it tells us, including, by the way, maths and science and history and all that stuff, while it is accurate on all of those things, and archaeology has proven time and time and time and time again, what do you know? The Bible's right. Who knew? 
Well, there's a lot of us who could have told them that the Bible is right, and archaeology keeps proving that true. It is not meant to be a scientific textbook. There's a lot of things about science that just aren't in there. That doesn't make it wrong. That just means that's not its goal. There's a lot of stuff about math that is not in the Bible. There's a lot of stuff. There's a ton of world history that's simply not recorded here. It's not because it didn't happen. <laughs> it's just that that's not the story that God chose to tell. Because God wanted to tell a very specific account about a very specific thing, knowing that the rest of world history and the maths and the sciences and all that other stuff was going to be around anyway. And so he inspired a very specific account that is factually true, it is 100% accurate, and it fits within world history without having to tell the whole of world history. And what that has done, um, let's see, do I have completely through and everything it tells us it doesn't tell, hey, I just said that, the whole story. Sometimes I forget what I'm, I put on my slides. Uh, uh, let me give you a couple, what, what happens though is, um, uh, uh, last week I used a phrase called apparent contradictions. Things that look like they contradict either in the Bible or, you know, in the Bible itself or in the Bible and outside the Bible, and they really don't. Okay, one obvious example is Genesis 1 and 2, the creation account. God said, this is how I did it. And here we go along and say, no, it happened another way. And I, I, I can just sort of imagine God in heaven saying, okay, but I was there, right? <laughs> you know, we, we actually have a firsthand witness account because God said, this is what I did, right? And we're like, no, we think it looks like this the other way. And God's like, yeah, you can think that, right? And so it looks like there's a contradiction. So-called science insists that everything has evolved over billions of years, right? Because it looks like if nothing, if we just look at the, the world today and nothing has changed, it's called uniformitarianism, if everything has remained the same and nothing has changed from the very beginning, this is what we would expect. And we sort of go try to rewind and look at it backwards. The problem is, is that the Bible says that something cataclysmic did happen in the past that would account for all of this stuff that we see, these fossils and these, these rock strata and all this stuff, we call it the global flood. Uh, if you're interested, there's a great documentary, we watched it a few years ago here, called Is Genesis History? Fantastic uh, documentary that, ex that shows how the flood, as outlined and, and, and recorded in Genesis, would explain everything that we see today. And it's presented by uh, a, a handful, probably eight or 12 um, uh, PhD scientists in, in various fields that speak to their expertise in those fields, okay? Is Genesis history fantastic uh, example? Uh, another, another example that, that um, scholars tend to look at and say, well, this doesn't match world history, is the account of Joseph, we get to uh, Exodus chapter 1 and we, we read that there arose a new king in Egypt that did not know Joseph. You're like, how could they not know Joseph? I mean, di I mean didn't they, did they not know how to write? I mean, what happened with all of this stuff with the seven years of plenty and the seven years of famine? I mean, he literally saved the country. How does a new king show up and just not know anything about Joseph? They say, see, that's, that's so silly. The problem is, is that because they try to date the story to fit their agenda. Remember I said everybody has an agenda. They try to date the story, the account, to fit their agenda. When in reality, if you date the account of Joseph that fits the biblical account, you know what happened in world history? The Egyptians were overthrown by a faction that did not recognize anything about the previous regime. What do you know? Maybe there was a new king who didn't care anything about the Egyptian history thus far and started to rule, and that is the king who didn't know Joseph. Isn't that interesting? World history, when we line up the Bible with actual events in world history, instead of setting up our own agendas, it actually works. The Bible's always been proven true. 
We could go on. Okay, lots and lots and lots of things. I'm not going to. But that does bring us to our survey because the goal of this survey is to, so that we can, again, see this as a collection, see this as, a, as a, an entire thing, and be comfortable. Some people... We spend so much time uh, in the New Testament, some of us are not quite as comfortable in the Old Testament, okay? Don't know where things are, don't know the books. Sometimes we're like, I didn't know that was in there. Um, uh, we just did uh, numbers in our, in our soap series, and uh, as Gary and I were working through the book of numbers together on the videos, one of the things I pointed out was, you may have known this was in the Bible somewhere, you just would not have guessed numbers, I mean, of all places, really? Numbers? That's where that is? Sure enough, okay? And it's in there. So uh, that's why we're doing this. So that said, what do I have here? When we finish Genesis 11, okay, we sort of touched on this last week. When we finish Genesis 11, the first 10 or 12 pages of the Bible, we have completed half of the history of the Bible. Okay? So from Genesis 12 to when John wrote the Revelation was only about 2,200 years, and from Genesis 1 through 11 is only about 2,100 years. So literally the first 10 pages, first 12 pages of the Bible, and the rest of the Bible, okay, now I understand the Revelation talks about the future that hasn't happened yet and everything, but from the time John wrote, okay, which was about 96, or about AD 96, that took the same amount of time for the first 11 pages and the rest of the collection to put together, okay? So there's a lot of stuff in those first 11 chapters, obviously, that we don't see, but it does talk, it sets the scene, it sets up everything else that's coming. So chapters 1 and 2, the creation of everything. Chapters 3 through 5, we see the fall into sin of humanity and how that affects different people. In fact, uh, chapter 5, if you've never read Genesis chapter 5 or you have not seen it for some time, almost every verse or every other verse ends with, and he died, and he died, and he died. He lived for so long, he had sons and daughters, and he died, and he died, and he died, and he died, and he died. It is a chapter of death. That's what Genesis chapter 5 is. Exciting reading, I'm telling you. It's just like, you know, inspirational and uplifting and everything. No, it tells us, it tells us that what happened in chapter 3 because of sin, this is the result. And we've been saying and saying, and he died for the past 4,000 years because that's what's been happening, right? 6,000 years. Chapters 6 through 9, we see the global flood. We have the, the account of Noah and, and how he saved some people and some animals, and then God said, replenish the earth. And in chapters 10 and 11, we see uh, chapter 10 actually is a table of nations, Noah's three sons, and how the world, all of the ethnicities, by the way, we don't say race, there's one race, one human race. Everything is not race, it's ethnicity. We have different backgrounds, we have different heritage, but we're all the same race, okay? Okay. Um, the three families, Noah's three sons, we get all of the ethnicities that come out uh, in that. And we see that in chapter 10. It's actually 70 nations are listed there. Very interesting. And then chapter 11 is the Tower of Babel where it zooms down and says, okay, this is how they spread. God confused the languages and this is how they spread. That's like the first 11 chapters in like four minutes. Okay, that's, that's the whole thing. And then the story slows way down way down. Starting with God calling Abram and says, I'm going to do something in you that's never been done before, and it will literally change the course of human history into eternity. I've chosen you. That's where Genesis 12 picks up, and we get the rest of the account all the way through the book of the Revelation. So the, the account, the story, the narrative that God chose to tell starting with Abraham, is primarily about the nation of Israel. Okay, and we see that all the way through the Old Testament. And in the New Testament, we see the church and God still working with Israel a little bit during this time and then returning his attention full-blown to Israel um, after uh, the, the church is raptured, after the church is taken off of the planet, rescued from God's coming wrath, that he focuses back on Israel. 
And we see four periods in Old Testament history, if we wanted to chunk these things out. And these are based off of the 11 books that I told you last week are the, are the things that, that push the story forward. You can take the, out of the 39, uh, or the 22 in, in, in Hebrew, out of those that we call the Old Testament, if we pull out 11 books and sort of, not like take them out of context, but raise them up above the rest of them, you can trace the chronology of history through those 11, and the rest of them just sort of fit in and give a more detail, added color commentary about what's going on. Sometimes that's the poetry, the wisdom books, sometimes that's the prophets, sometimes that's a little bit more history that, you know, while this was going on, hey, this happened too, you know, type thing, all right? But these 11 books, Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Joshua, form this first period uh, that we call the, the formation of Israel. In Judges, we see a theocracy. In uh, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, which is really one of the longest periods, um, we see uh, the monarchy of Israel, and then in Ezra and Nehemiah we see the oppression, the exile, and the restoration of the nation. Because again, God is choosing to focus on the nation of Israel, and one of the greatest things about this is a reminder of God's faithfulness which we do need to be reminded of continuously, constantly. Because as Israel was, was in the place, or was supposed to be in the place of God's blessing, and he said, this is what I want you to do, their normal response was, yes, we'll do it, and then do the exact opposite thing. Okay, <laughs> right? Sound familiar? Anybody do this today? Does the church do this? Yes, we're going to obey God. And we do the exact opposite thing. Uh, in, in, in my... Um, uh, I, some of you know I teach uh, Greek for Calvary University on, on Tuesday nights, and I was teaching last week, and we're in the book of Ephesians, and, and the students are, are working through the Greek text, and they're trying to get all this, this cool stuff, and it, and it really does come out uh, the, the, the forest for the trees type thing, because they get so, you know, translating this word this exactly the right way because, you know, that's going to get them a good grade and everything, that my job is also to zoom back out a little bit and say, don't forget how this all fits together. And in Ephesians 3 last week, what one of the things I pointed out, because they were so zoomed in, I said, take a look at this. What it says in Ephesians 3 is that God right now has the church in a position to show his awesome wisdom to the world and to the demonic rulers that we can't see, all of these authorities. God is proving how awesome he is through us. I'm like, I'm not sure that that's actually showing wisdom. <laughs> or, you know, whatever. Are we actually doing what God expects us to do? Are we being who God expects us to be? You know, if somebody looks at the church right now, are they looking back at God saying, that's your plan? Like, really, this is your infinite wisdom? Right? But that's what it says. That's what it says. At this time, the church is supposed to be showing God's infinite awesome wisdom in how he works and how he does things in this world and in, even in the unseen world. And it shows God's faithfulness that, that as we look back through the, the Israel's history, we see his faithfulness, we see his trustworthiness, we see his, his, uh, his uh, mercy and all of those things. We have those as well today. So what I'd like to do today is, I know last week was sort of like a fire hose, like, you know, here's the whole Old Testament. I want to do the same thing today, but uh, sort of get a little bit more detail just as we see what's going on in these four sections of human history, because we don't spend as much time in the Old Testament, and it is long, right? The Old Testament is seems like it's forever long, and so you want to read through it, and you're like, oh, it's so ever. Here's a quick overview of what the Old Testament looks like, starting in Genesis uh, 12, and then moving literally all the way through the rest of the book as we follow through these, these, these 11. So uh, Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, and Joshua took about 700 years. Okay, that's, that's, the, that's the area. We see certain key people, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, and Joshua. There are others in there as well. Isaac had a brother named Ishmael 
who also turned into a, a, a leader of a great nation or a great many tribes. We see Jacob's brother Esau, who also had a lot of, uh, not as big as Ishmael, but had a, a, a large family. But these are the, these are, if you wanted to outline these books and just sort of trace through these books, this would be a great way to study them. Study the lives of these uh, specific six men. Um, in Genesis chapter 47, the family of Israel moved from the land of Canaan from the, into the land of Egypt because of the whole Joseph story, and he was protecting them and feeding them because of a great famine that God had sent. And there were about 75 people who moved from Canaan down to Egypt. Not a big deal. It's a family. They were ranchers, and the Egyptians didn't like shepherds and ranchers, so they stuck them out in this you know, rural area, which was great for their animals, and the Egyptians didn't have to deal with them. It was perfect. And what God did is over the next several chapters, which is a few years, from 40, Genesis 47 to Exodus 3, that 75 people grew into a nation of 2 to 3 million. Now Egypt is a little concerned. <laughs> now there's a question about what are they going to do? It's not just a family of 75. Now we really do have a couple million people. What's going to happen? So for a couple of hundred years, Israel was there in Egypt for about 400 years, 430 years, but only for a couple of hundred years, about 200 years, were they enslaved. And Egypt enslaved them. And then in uh, the, the rest of the book of Exodus talks about their exit. Exodus is actually the Greek word for departure. That's all it means. And in Exodus, we have God rescues them from Egypt. Uh, Israel receives uh, their, their marching orders, essentially their constitution, their civil government, and their mode of worship, the sacrificial system, directly from God at Mount Sinai. And from there, they were supposed to go into, back to the land of Canaan where they came from 400 plus years ago and actually take that over as their land. And God promised it to Abraham, and that's why it's called the promised land, because he promised it to the nation. I mean, literally, I mean, we're really creative, I know. We're really good at this, right? He promised it to Abraham and his descendants, and so when they left Egypt to go back to their ancestral land, it was the land promised to them, the land of promise or the promised land. The book of Numbers um, says that they explored Canaan a little bit, but they refused to go into it. God said, go take it. They said, we can't. And so for the next almost 40 years, they lived as nomads in the wilderness. So close and yet so far. And God said, park here. And so they set up camp. And sometimes it was days or weeks or months. And then eventually God said, all right, get up. We're going to move. And so they moved to a new place. And God said, all right, camp here. And they did that for almost four decades until that entire generation of, of men who had rebelled against God and said, no, we cannot take the land. We're all dead. More than 600,000 men. And we don't know how many women as well, but more than 600,000 men had to die during that time of almost 40 years. And, and I've done the math in the past, and, and I don't remember exactly, but it's right around in the neighborhood of um, 50 funerals a day during that time. That's a lot of dead bodies that were falling at that time. Okay, And it was during this time that Moses wrote the very first psalm that we have recorded, Psalm 90, and he said as he looked around, our years are... 70 years, maybe somebody lives to 70. Maybe if they're extra strong, they live to 80. That's not a prescription about how long we're allowed to live today. That was Moses saying, this is what I'm seeing as we wander around this desert, as we live as nomads, homeless, because we refuse to do what God told us to do. The book of Deuteronomy fits at the end of, of uh, Numbers where now that entire generation, that first generation out of Egypt has died off. And, and so Moses gives the law again, gives the constitution again. And Joshua gives the account of when they moved into the land. It only took five to seven years, which is actually pretty big because one of the things that, that God gets charged 
because of the book of Joshua is God is a genocidal murderer. He's wiping out all of these, all of these you know, tribes and nations and everything. That's not the case at all. There were only seven strongholds that were under God's divine curse that God told Joshua, you have to destroy that area. Okay, that's it, just seven. The rest of everybody else was allowed to evacuate. And it took them five or more years to go through the entire land. And they knew, the Canaanites knew that the Israelites were coming in, in, uh, when, when the spies went into the nation of, or to the city of Jericho, a lady by the name of Rahav, Rahab, told them, we heard that you were coming and we were afraid of you. And they said, why were we afraid of us? We haven't done anything. We heard what God did at the Red Sea 40 years ago. You're still quaking in your boots 40 years later? Yeah, because we assume you still have the same God. Okay, that was the news that was all over Canaan, and some people decided we're going to fight anyway. They had their chance. Okay, Joshua gave them every opportunity to get out of the land because that was the land that God had promised. And if they decided to stay and fight, they were going to lose. Okay, because this is the same God who rescued Israel from Egypt through the Red Sea 40 years ago. He ended up taking 31 kings and all seven strongholds. The problem is, is that they did not actually conquer everything or completely evacuate the land like they were supposed to. But it is at this moment now, the rest of the book, the second half of Joshua, is the division of the land amongst the tribes. Okay, now we're in the land. So what's supposed to happen? What's supposed to happen is what's called a theocracy. And a theocracy is simply the Greek word theos is God, and theocracy is the rule by, right? So a monarchy or a democracy is ruled by the people. Theocracy is ruled by God. Monarchy is ruled by one. Oligarchy is ruled by a few. It's all the same thing, okay? A theocracy is God is the one who is in charge. He rules. And that's how judges started, God chose Joshua to replace Moses to lead the people into the land. He did not choose anybody to replace Joshua. Intentionally. Because once they got into the land, the priests were supposed to arbitrate the law. The Levites were supposed to arbitrate the law. And God was supposed to rule. There wasn't supposed to be any other like a single ruler like, uh, like a Moses or a Joshua. God was going to rule the people and it was going to be great because they were going to live in perfect obedience and, you know, all of that, right? Well, of course, that doesn't happen. We're still sinful people. They were still sinful people. And so uh, what we find is that Judges chapter 1, verse 8, is the problem. And in, not Jude, how about Judges? Verse 28, whenever Israel was strong militarily... They forced the Canaanites to do hard labor, but they never totally conquered them. God said, go in and take over the land. And they didn't do it. And because they didn't do it, um, these people ended up being a problem. And in chapter, um, chapter 2, starting at verse 11, we find this cycle in chapter 2, Judges, we're in Judges chapter 2, starting in verse 11, the Israelites did evil before the Lord by worshiping the Baals, the Baal, these false gods, which is exactly what God said would happen in the book of Deuteronomy. If you don't get this, rid of this stuff, if you don't get rid of the people, if you don't kick them out, you don't have to kill them all, but if you don't kick them out, you're going to be attempted to worship all these things. And that's exactly what they did. They abandoned the Lord God of their ancestors who brought them out of the land of Egypt, by the way. They followed other gods, the gods of the nations who lived around them. They worshiped them and made the Lord angry. They abandoned the Lord and worshiped Baal and the Ashtoreths. And the Lord was furious with Israel and he handed them over to robbers who plundered them. He turned them over to their enemies who lived around them. They could no longer withstand their enemies' attacks. Whenever they went out to fight, the Lord did them harm. 
just as he had warned and solemnly vowed he would do. And this is a big deal, okay? Because some people look at this and say, oh, but they didn't know. The fact of the matter is, is that in both Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28, the first generation out of Egypt and the second generation, God warned them, if you don't obey me, if you don't, do this thing, this is what I'm going to do. They had plenty of warning. And God, because he is faithful and cannot deny himself, like it says in 2 Timothy, he had to do what he threatened he would do. And he started small and he got harsher and harsher and harsher and harsher, just like it says, especially in Deuteronomy 28. These punishments, these, this cycle that we see where one generation got worse and worse, throughout the book of Judges, and the, the judgments and the punishments got harsher. This was not sudden. This was not supposed to be a surprise. They knew this. The problem is, is that this was now the third generation. And there's a principle that we see today that when the first generation of, of, of a family is saved out of whatever pagan life they had, that is a major spiritual issue. I talk about this with, with our children, and, 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 and they've heard me say this before. The first generation, which in our family would be my, my parents, they both came from unsaved families. They were saved. They knew what God had done for them. Then they had some kids, and I grew up in church, and this is just part of life. This is just who we are. And then I had some kids, and now they are three steps removed from a family that doesn't follow God. And now it's so much part of life that it's just, don't even think about it anymore. And what happens is that each generation, even though they're more and more steeped in religion, they get further and further away from the true God. That's the principle that we see today in families all over. This is why God in De Deuteronomy chapter 6 said, teach your children to follow me. Talk about it constantly. Don't let it just become the thing. Because usually what happens is by the third or fourth generation, we've stopped thinking about it at all, and now Church and Christianity and the Bible have no priority in our lives, and we start with a new family that is Christian in name only, and they're not even really saved. This was the third gener. What we see in the book of Judges is the third generation out of Egypt, and they've completely forgotten about God. They don't care, except when things go bad. Then they remember him, then they call out to him, and he is faithful, and he rescues them again and he rescues them again. But each succeeding generation, we're told in Judges 2, got worse, got further and further away from God. And this theocracy that God intended, now, not that God was surprised, of course, but this theocracy that he intended, this theocracy that he designed to lead them, just showed how depraved they were, how far away from him they got. Until finally they said, we want a king just like the nations around us. And God said, no, you really don't. <laughs> you, you really don't. Yes, we do. Just like the nations around you? Yes. Don't you know what those kings are like? Don't you know what a human ruler is like? Don't you know what he's going to do to you? Don't you know about the taxes and the oppression and the, the, the any time he gets a, a whim about anything, that's the way he goes and you're going to suffer for it. We've seen this in every human government since the beginning of time. And they said, we want a king just like all the other nations. And so began the monarchy, period. Samuel, in 1 Samuel chapters 1 through 9, was the last judge and the last uh, prophet of the theocracy period where God was, was uh, leading, and he used judges. And, and on the, the previous slide, I, I said, um, two slides back, I guess, if the people, the priests, and the Levites had obeyed, the book of Judges never would have occurred. The book of Judges doesn't even, isn't even supposed to be in the world history. Had they obeyed the way they were supposed to, all of these names in the book of Judges never would have happened. Okay, but they didn't obey. And so we go into the monarchy, and in the year 1050, roughly B.C., in 1 Samuel chapter 10, Saul became the first king, 
And what do you know? He was a problem. Okay, David became the second king 40 years later, followed by his son Solomon. And these were the only three kings who ruled over all 12 tribes. That was it. Because when Solomon died in 931, Israel split into two. There was the northern uh, tribes, ten tribes in the north that went by the name of Israel, usually Ephraim sometimes. And their capital was Samaria in the land, in the tribal land of Ephraim, that's why. And then the Judah, the Judahites and the Benjaminites, uh, the Simeonites, the, the family of Simeon actually got sucked into Judah. So it's basically two tribes. Judah and Benjamin, and they were called Judah. Northern tribe, southern tribe. And what happened for, this, um, for the second half of the book of, of uh, Samuel, for all of 2 Samuel, and for the first half of the book of 1 Kings, we have a united kingdom, we have a united Israel. Halfway through 1 Kings, we, we find this division. And what happened was, oh, Saul feared men, but not God. That was his problem. That's a reason why he fell, why he was a bad king. He did not fear God. He feared people instead. Israel was, or uh, David was Israel's best king. And Solomon gave Israel actually her golden age of everything except for the worship of the true God. It was the golden age of literature. It was the golden age of maths and sciences. Uh, one of my favorite passages in 1 Kings is in chapter 4 that talks about Solomon. He wrote botany manuals. Right? He, 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 he studied birds, he studied plants, he studied herbs, he studied all this stuff. He was prolific. He wrote Proverbs, he wrote Psalms and songs. And just, it was the golden age of everything in Israel. Wealth, there, it, was, it was so, it was so um, there was so much money that silver could be thrown on the street and people wouldn't pick it up. That's how much money there was in Israel at that time. Solomon's navy has been proven to have gone all over the entire planet, collecting animals, collecting things, brought them back. It was the golden age of everything except the worship of the true God. Because what Solomon did is Solomon said, yes, Jehovah is the best God, but he's not the only true God. And so you can have a nation that is material, materially very wealthy, very rich indeed, but spiritually empty. And that was Israel at this time. That's why after, after Solomon, it split. And in 931 BC, divided into north and south, Israel and Judah, these two nations, these two, essentially these two nations, each had 20 kings. And for the rest of uh, 1 Kings and all of 2 Kings, it tells us about these 20 kings each, north and south. All 20 of them in the north were bad. Not a single one of them followed God. Out of the 20 in the south, only eight of them followed God. And so what happened was people who wanted to follow God who were in the northern part of Israel left, moved south, which made the north even worse. Okay? And so the north fell, the Israel, the, 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 the northern kingdom fell to Assyria in 722 BC, and we see that in 2 Kings. And only 100 years later, uh, from 605 to 586, over a period of 20 years, in three captivities, the southern kingdom finally fell to Babylon, who had taken over Assyria. So now all of Israel was in Babylon. And from 586 to 539, we have um, uh, uh, Babylon and then Persia conquered Babylon in 539. We see this in the book of Daniel, chapter 5. Belshazzar sees the handwriting on the wall. Remember that account, that story? That was the night that Persia took over Babylon. And that year, Cyrus, the king of Persia, said, you can go back to your country. You can go back to your family lands. You can restore Jerusalem. You can rebuild. You can do all of that. And in 539, a man by the name of Zerubbabel um, uh, did decide to go back. He took only 50,000 Jews with him. Almost everybody else decided to stay. And it was during this time um, that we find the book of Esther, people who were born in exile, they were born in Babylon, they were born in Assyria, they were born in Persia, 
Why would they go back? They have no homeland there, as far as they were concerned. They didn't have any ties back. This is several generations now. They, didn't, they, don't, they don't know what they were going to expect. So again, the book of Esther, everybody sets Esther up as a hero. Oh, Esther's my favorite Old Testament woman. Don't. Don't. I can think of others that you can pick as your Old Testament heroes. She shouldn't have even been there. She should not have even been there. Her family should have gone back. She shouldn't have been born there. There were all sorts of other reasons why she shouldn't have done what she did, but suffice it to say, the book of Esther never should have happened. The whole threat on the Jewish people who were still in Persia never should have happened because they shouldn't have been there. Okay? All right? So Zerubbabel in 539 brings about 50,000 people back. They rebuild the temple. It falls apart again. About 80 years later or so, Ezra comes back uh, with only about 1,500 people and focuses on a spiritual restoration. The temple is rebuilt. They finally get that back going. Another dozen years later, Nehemiah comes back. Um, we don't know how many people came with him, but his focus was restoring the political side, restoring the wall around Jerusalem, restoring the city, getting people to build their houses so that they can live there again. So over the course of about 100 years, uh, from 539 to 445 BC, we see Israel coming back in three sections to the land of Israel. And since this time, they have always been occupied. There's always been a nation here. Persia still ran them. Then Greece overran Persia, or over, you know, conquered Persia, and Greece was their ruler. Then Rome conquered, and we go into the New Testament, and we still see a Roman problem in. Israel, right? And then in AD 70, Rome destroys Jerusalem and um, about 50 years, 60 years later, the emperor Hadrian says, I'm going to rename the place Palestine because it's, it's similar to Philistine, some of their arch enemies, and we are not going to recognize Israel as a nation anymore. This is why we don't use the term Palestine. This is why we don't use the term Palestine and Palestinian when it comes to Israel, because that is not its name. Its name is Israel. It was for thousands of years before the word Palestine was even invented by a Roman ruler intentionally to be, be uh, animus, an, animosity toward the Israeli people, the Jewish people. So, again, very quick, but we made it all the way through the Old Testament. Can you believe that? Again, all right. If you want to go back and watch the recording and slow it down to about quarter of a speed, you might actually hear something. I understand. The history that God chose to record. Here's the principle. The history that God chose to record is not better than the rest of world history. It's not more factual than the rest of world history. But what it is, is it's more important than the rest of world history because that is how God chose to run world history. Okay, and it puts God's faithfulness on full display. And if God can be faithful through 2,000 years of world history, we can trust him to be faithful today in our families, in our country, and in nations across the world, right? This is why we pray. This is why we study. This is why I want you to be comfortable and to understand the whole package so that we can trust him better. Remember, the whole goal is not to master the Bible. There's a lot of people who know a lot about the Bible, but they don't know the God behind the Bible. The goal is not to master the Bible. The goal is to get the Bible into us so that we can, like we say, know him better and love him more. And when we see his faithfulness on display throughout world history, that allows us to do that.